So I don't want to oversimplify what, you know, sitting, you know, everybody knows sitting is not the good thing. You know, when we were younger, we didn't want the kids, you know, don't sit, go outside, go play. And, you know, gradually over the last couple of decades, it's like everybody's sitting a lot more. And it really didn't take people, you know, they didn't take notice until in the last, you know, say decade or so with more people living a sedentary lifestyle. You know, everybody's on a computer. So many of the jobs these days are computer jobs. You know, my first couple jobs, I stood. I was at a hardware store on my feet all day. They'd never let me sit. You're on the sales floor. Um, I did have a sales job, but I was up going in the warehouse back and forth, checking stock and things like that. So everything has kind of evolved. And, you know, with the good, there's often the bad. So I don't think I need to oversimplify, you know, sitting is not a good thing. It's kind of like smoking. You know, it's like, oh, let's, let's have an hour talk about how smoking is bad. It's like, you, you kind of get it. But maybe what's not being discussed as, as much is like, what are the, the physiological changes that happen when you're sitting for a prolonged amount of time? And that's kind of where I come in with this. So I'm 60 years old. I just turned 60 this year. Yay, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the club, right? But I started this fitness journey when I was about 16 years old. And my father was, uh, he was al an alcoholic and he smoked a lot and his idea of exercise was his work. He was a tradesman, he was a pipe fitter, you know, a welder. So he would come home at the end of the day, you know, it's all you know, dirty and nasty, sometimes burned. And uh, you know, he'd have to relax and throw down a few beers and smoke some cigarettes. And that didn't make sense to me. Because you know, I saw that he really didn't look like he was in good shape. He was always sick, um, always something happening with his health. So then, you know, I'm going to school, and you start learning. I started learning about health and fitness, and I really embraced that. So I started doing martial arts training when I was 16 years old. And aside from the self-defense part of it, a fair amount of um, training with martial arts is the fitness aspect and to have discipline. So I saw my dad didn't have either of those. You know, no, no physical fitness, no discipline when it came to you know, his habits and that. So I spent a lot of time there. So as the years went by, I became an instructor and I would teach and I was managing schools with other instructors and friends. And all of my peers were like, don't, don't worry about it. As, you know, as we get older with this, people are gonna realize the, the benefits that come from fitness and exercise, you know, more specifically with martial arts training. And I was like, when's it coming? When's it coming? Because it's always a challenge to get people to come out, to sign up, to stay healthy. And I thought it was kind of a, a no-brainer. Like, why wouldn't people want to do stuff to stay active? Well, look at where we're at today. People are more interested in being on their phone, mostly the younger generation, but it is making its way to you know, other generations. But they'd rather spend time on their phone or on their computer than talking with other people or engaging with them. So that's part of the reason why this you know, prolonged sitting is turning to be a health, a chronic health issue in the United States and worldwide too. So you know, my kids, um, both of them are uh, about college age. My son graduated, he's got a job now. My daughter, she's got four more years, she's in grad school and she's gonna pursue pharmacy. They stayed active, they were on the rowing team, my daughter was in band. My wife and me kind of instilled, you gotta do something to stay active. So my, my son ended up going to, to college with a, a D1 scholarship for rowing and did, he did pretty well at Syracuse University up in New York. They were usually in the top 10 nationwide behind Yale and Harvard and all those guys. So anyway, fitness has been very much a part of my body or my, my life and I've encouraged other people to try to you know, stay healthy and do things to, to stay healthy. So we gotta keep moving here on to the next thing or else I'm gonna stay on one slide for the whole presentation. So you know, this is kind of a gross exaggeration, people sitting around, no shirt on, but you know, really what it is. They're saying uh, you sit for, for every two hours of sitting, you drastically increase the amount of chances of becoming diabetic. And the next slide, I'll kind of get into more of the statistics. Hey there. Come on, come on in. We, we, we have front row seating that is at a premium. So it's kind of like Southwest Airlines. We're changing it up, okay? I'll sit here to begin with. You can sit next to my best friend. That's, that's what we're calling that guy. Okay. Biff, best friend forever. So again, this slide here, it's just kind of a gross exaggeration of, you know, people sitting around a little lot and not, not really doing too much to stay motivated. So I like to look at this whole sitting situation is like you have this really nice, 
high performance vehicle and it's, it's sitting in a garage and you're kind of afraid to take it out on the road, you know, you got all kinds of beautiful, glorious things there to go pursue an adventure, but the car's kind of stuck in the garage. So what happens if that high performance car stays sedentary for too long, the tires are gonna start to rot because they're rubber. A good part of the engine with the wiring and the hoses, they're gonna start to rot too. And then the engine oil is gonna start to coagulate and become thicker. Looks beautiful, but really on the inside, that car will not run well if it hasn't started in the last you know, couple months or you know, a year sitting in the garage. It's not gonna perform well once somebody goes to take it out. So that's kind of what is happening with our society right now. And I know you guys are really active, because that's why you're in the room right now. Because you, you recognize that you want to stay involved and engaged, right? You know, keep moving. Move it or lose it, that type of attitude. So try, we try not to be, you know, my, my uh, presentation is we try not to be that beautiful car sitting in the garage. We got to get it out. Got to get it out on the road. So then you can actually see when there's a problem. How do you know if your alignment is off if you don't drive the car? How do you know that the steering is loose if you're not driving the car. So I know a lot of people are sitting more because it's in response to not wanting to fall or get injured or you know maybe they fear um, violence, you know, getting robbed or mugged or things like that. So these are all things that are taken into account why people are sitting, sitting a lot more and staying inside. So these are like all the scary statistics about why sitting is so bad. And I try not to focus on the, the numbers so much you know, it's like, oh, 147% increase of cardiovascular. Know, know that these are things that are very serious. The numbers themselves, statistics, if you're a numbers person, you know, then sure, look at the numbers. But hey there, come on in. Front row seating, it's going fast. So, you know, cardiovascular, and I'm going to get into some of the details of why these things are happening too, not just that, oh, it's bad, right? Um, the chances of people becoming more diabetic, go up because they're sitting more, they're not moving. Uh, a new term that's been popular recently is metabolic syndrome, and that's the ability for your metabolism, you know, how you process energy, the food you eat, that it's not, it's not functioning as well. So that's metabolic syndrome. People are gaining more weight because they're not burning the calories they would be using to, to get around. Um, sitting is associated with just increased risk of death overall. Okay, well, I stay home, I'm gonna be safe. I'm not gonna get into a car accident. I'm not gonna get robbed or mugged or anything, but you know, you're, you're, you're not living your life. You're stuck at home. So we come over to here, they say 80% of adults experience back pain at some point in their life. I've heard that many times over the years. I've had back problems. You sit too much, it's gonna make your back weak. You stand too much, it's gonna make your back stiff. So where's the, the, the sweet spot in between? Oftentimes that comes from adding other activities to your life, and, you know, some type of exercise. Um, what do we got? Individuals who sit more than six hours a day have a higher chance of being depressed or anxious. So what's happening is the more you sit, you're kind of being in your own little world and you might not see or experience other things that are going on around you. And you think that just because it's in front of you or on a television screen, that's the way the world is or life is. That sitting part right there with your emotions has a lot to do with the chemistry in your body. If you're not actually moving your body and getting the, the, the blood moving and the chemicals to engage and be released for you know, being active, your, your, your blood chemistry is off and that can affect your mood and your emotions. Prolonged sitting is associated with a lack of, of memory. So if you're not moving your body as much, in general you're not getting blood flowing from the toes to the top of your head, the brain's not getting as much blood, so it's not able to process your memory as well as it used to be. So these are all like the scary things that the doctors are gonna throw out there and you can read studies on it and the statistical numbers will be a little bit different depending upon whose study it is and depending upon if they want your money or not, right? Who's, who's, who's funding the study? So this kind of shows you the, the circle of how one thing leads into the next. Everything is connected. Okay, you've probably heard this at some point, you know, mind, body, and spirit. Okay, that, that makes sense, but how is it really connected? So the more people sit, what I was saying, they're, they're isolating from others. Maybe they're not getting out of the house as much. They're not being as socially active. Their network is much smaller. Staying indoors. If you're staying indoors more in Florida, there's a good chance you're not getting sunlight. Too much sunlight, you're going to get 
uh, skin cancer. Not enough, your vitamin D is affected. The vitamin D production in your body affects your bones. Your bones affect your stability when it comes to getting around. So that's all connected. Lack of fresh air, you know, come on, you gotta get out and get some fresh air every day, right? I don't know about you folks, but if I'm cooped up, like with the storms or whatever, even if it's a couple days inside, I gotta get out. Gotta get some fresh air, you gotta see the sun. That leads to um, staying indoors, again, less physical activity. Unless you're staying inside and working out in your, your room or somewhere, you know, they got facilities here for working out, I'm sure, and doing physical activity. You, if you're sitting more, you're less likely to be able to be active. The muscles aren't you know, as flexible or strong. Um, that brings us back to the immune system. If all these other things start to get out of whack, your, your immune system is gonna be affected. So weren't, weren't you folks like really active, or you might still be now, but when you were kids, didn't your parents like encourage you to go out, get out of the house, do things? And if you were inside the house, they kind of kick you out. Like, what, what are you doing here? You wanna clean the house? No, get out, go do something. That was kind of like the punishment for me. If I couldn't find something to do, I would be doing some project around the house. Cleaning, vacuuming, you know, repairing something. So hopefully this makes sense. As we keep going through this, I encourage you folks, ask a question or comment if you got something. Say, I really don't like that graphic, Jim. You used the wrong color. No, you know, this isn't just me talking. This is you folks engaging if you have questions or comments to go with this. So my background in martial arts is in um, mostly Korean martial arts and to some extent Chinese mar martial arts. And if you're familiar with the history of all this stuff, um, you know, after the war, after the wars, whichever one you want to pick, there was always immigrants that came to the United States. So a lot of the Koreans came over the United States after the Korean War. And they started teaching martial arts and they could earn a living. And the Chinese came over at some point and it's like, hey, I can make good money in the United States teaching this to the Americans. So there's a phrase that in, in uh, traditional Chinese medicine and in martial arts is the death begins in the big toe. And it's kind of like, what was that? Uh, the detergent commercial? Like, how do you get the laundry so clean? It's like ancient Chinese secret, right? <laughs> so they kind of made you know, like a, 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 you know, a joke out of it a little bit. So if you stub your toe in the middle of the night, you get up to use the restroom. This might have happened to one or two of you, right? You stub your toe and then it, you're in extreme pain. So you maybe hit something else. You hit the wall or you might end up falling down. So it seems like something small, but just your big toe can inflict a lot of pain. A headache. You have a headache, oftentimes it's enough to stop you from doing whatever you had planned for that day. So small things can affect us in a big way. So aside from the, the you know, hurting your toe, if you injure any part of your foot, you're probably not gonna be as mobile. It's gonna hurt for you to get around, right? From a confidence point of view, once you fall, some of you might have fallen, you, you might not feel as confident to do tasks that you might have done previously because you know you can fall again. So the feet, in the traditional Chinese medicine, um, theory of meridians is what this guy's for here. This is Biff. We nicknamed Biff from some of my other speaking events. My best friend forever. That's what they call it. So this is a representation of meridians, which are kind of like, they're not the nerves, they're not the veins, but it's more like electricity. It's very small, light current of electricity, if you will, that travels through the body. Anybody ever hear that before? Meridians, traditional Chinese medicine. So your feet and your hands are where they either begin or end, most of them. And then there's some on the face too. So if you injure your toes, there's the thought that maybe those meridians are getting injured also. At the very least, you're not gonna be as mobile. You're not gonna be getting as much exercise. You're not gonna be enjoying yourself. So that's why death in the big toe has some, some relevance, all right? So structural posture begins in your feet. And you folks have bad shoes? You ever have a pair of shoes that's just like uncomfortable to wear? You gotta get good shoes. I can tell if my shoes are, are, are not good for me if I look at the soles after a couple weeks and there's part of the heel, see this one's starting to wear down a little bit. If my other one's wearing down, at least it's balanced. At least both shoes are wearing down. But if one side is grossly more, has more tread, worn away on it, then chances are I'm probably doing something weird. I'm walking kind of sideways. So my feet work there, you know, all the points, all the joints cumulatively add up. An injury in your foot, eventually you might feel in your hip. Injury in your back, eventually you might feel in your neck. So all this stuff makes sense, right? 
This is all like, you know this, why would I want to be sitting all day if this was going to be the benefit or the, the disadvantage of doing it? So on this side, like I lightly had said about falling, if you fall and injure, say like your wrist, maybe you sprained it, you didn't necessarily break it, chances of you falling again is probably double because you already fell, so you already are kind of programmed that that can happen again. It might not be a once in a lifetime event. If you fall and injure your spine, your vertebrae, you fall, you injure your hip, your hip throws your, your spine off, now you got a hip and spine problem. Chances of you falling again is four times as likely. So that's the spiral. Once somebody falls, there's a good chance that their health is gonna get worse. My, my wife has an uncle who just passed away a couple weeks ago. This exact thing happened. He fell, injured his hip, was in the hospital, trying to get the hip to you know, be mended, and he ended up getting pneumonia, and he passed away about two weeks later. So you folks are probably more familiar with this than I am. It does happen quite often. So again, this is a reason to not just be sitting, but some people will look at it as, I'm afraid to get up. If I am more active, I am getting out, I have more of a chance of falling. But on the other side, if you're more active, then maybe you won't fall because everything is stronger. You have more confidence in you know, getting from one place to the next. So everybody's doing good? The big, the big and small triangles on the foot. So if you folks are active, that's great. Most people, as they get older, again, they're kind of picking what they want to do to stay active, it's swimming, walking, probably not you know, doing marathons these days or bodybuilder competitions, right? You're finding something that's appropriate for you. A lot of the exercises people pick, though, they really don't do anything for their feet. They wear shoes, you know, you might run, walk, swim, but they're not really focusing on the actual foot. So there's this surface right here between your big toe, the ball of your foot, and your little toe. And that's what you use to kind of propel yourself forward. So if that's flexible, that's good, because you can adjust and you can, you can move your body and feel where your center of gravity is at. It goes all the way to the heel. So when you step, you step from your heel to the ball of your foot and you push. So most people aren't looking, they're not looking at their exercises moving those parts of their foot. Same thing with their hands. They're holding their hands if they're doing some kind of weight training or dumbbells, but they're not really focusing on doing you know, fine motor skill movements, putting their hands in unique positions, you know, things like this. So those are all beneficial. Moving your feet, other than just having you know, uh, your shoes on and walking, there's a lot more you can do for that. And I'll, I'll touch upon that as we get farther into this. So there's this thing in your calves and ankles called the calf pump, the calf muscle pump. The more you move your calves, the more it helps with your blood circulation. So oftentimes people think of their heart as being their more, most prominent you know, uh, device in their body that helps with blood circulation. That's the heart, you, know, you gotta move the heart. You gotta stay you know, with your arms and your legs, that makes the heart move more. Well, you also have your diaphragm, the more you move your diaphragm, that helps your blood to circulate more. And the more you move your ankle and your calf, that's the third heart. If you can move that, that is you know, that much better than just relying upon this heart. It's almost like you get three for one. You know, it's like, oh, I got the, dia the, the diaphragm muscle, I got the, the calf muscle, and I got the heart muscle. I got three ways that I can help move my circulation. So even if you're not standing more, if you're moving your ankle and your calf, that's helping with your circulation. And it's helping with your flexibility. And you see me standing on one leg, it's helping with my balance. So you don't necessarily have to be up and doing all kinds of stuff to get the calves to be engaged. The calf muscle pump, that's what that's called. So and here's the process of you know, how you're walking and when your calf muscles are contracted at different points, whether you're on your toes or your heel. On the previous slide, this kind of showed the, the valves during your legs. So again, if you're not standing and being active as much, those valves don't work as well. They need to be exercised also. And that comes from standing, walking, running, swimming, doing activities. If you're sitting a lot, the valves say, hey, we're not that busy, we're not that active, and they start to you know, atrophy. So keeping the calves healthy, really a good, a good uh, Good strategy. So a little while ago I said how an injury in one part of your body will affect another. They call this the kinetic, the kinetic chain. So if I injure my foot, there's a good chance 
another joint farther up is going to be injured. It goes down the other way too. If you have a shoulder injury, it's going to maybe throw your hips a little sideways because you're favoring one side of your body. So sitting in a chair, right now you probably notice you're favoring one side. When I'm standing and talking, I'm favoring one side. It comes from sitting in a chair for years and years, um, driving. You folks have all been driving. Pretty sure you've driven a good portion of your life, right? You got your arm on the window, you got your hand on the steering wheel, or some other variety of that, and it throws your spine off. Guys used to have a um, wallet in the back pocket all the time. That was standard. Always have the wallet in the back pocket. Last couple decades, with these kind of chronic problems coming up, more people have been putting their wallet in their front pocket. I have my phone. It's in my front pocket. I don't want to sit on it. So uh, women, a lot of women have purses. One or two of you might have purses that are heavier than my wallet. I'm just, just throwing that out there. It might be a little heavier, right? So that's going to throw your shoulders off. Child rearing, it's going to throw your shoulders off if you're holding a child. I did that for uh, the first six to nine months when my kids were born. My wife and me, we decided I was going to stay at home because I have a business from home. And uh, I would have the, my son on my hip. And my back started to get thrown out of whack. So then I would move to the other side. Like, I need a break on this side. I'd move to the other side. He'd throw a fit because he knew my heart was on the one side. When he was young, he could sense that. So he wanted to be on the side with the heart. It's like, he knew it. I didn't know it, but my back was out of whack. So I had to go to chiropractor for you know, a couple months to get my back back in line. So hopefully, again, this makes sense as we move on. So if you do sit for a certain amount of time, I'm not going to look at anybody right now and point you out. A lot of people sit and they hunch over. Other people will try and maintain some stability and arch their back so that they have good posture when they sit. The problem is it accumulates. So over days, weeks, months, years, you might find yourself where when one part gets really strong, the other side that complements it might become weak. So that's how all these balance. If you have a tight back from sitting with it arched too much, your stomach becomes weak. The stomach muscles become weak, the hips start to rotate. And now it starts to throw the, the rear end muscles. They start to become weak, and then the front of your legs become tight. So this can go back and forth depending upon how you sit, whether it's too much arch, too much rounded. So um, I talked about martial arts a little bit. Most of the things that I teach, I have a couple classes I teach throughout the week for people that are in this age group. Age group being people that are older than me. Anybody that's 60 and older is probably you know, coming to my class. So we do a fair amount of exercises where we roll the spine down so it's as rounded as it can become, and then we go the other direction where we try to arch it. So we try to go through that full range of motion. And that's just one exercise. There's you know, literally hundreds, if not thousands, of other exercises. So once you start to get the concept of how muscles work, there's a pulley system. Most of the muscles have one side that pulls and the other side pushes. Or one side tenses, the other side relaxes. So the, everything's on a pulley system. If you have one part of your body that's strong, you're probably going to be another side that opposes it that might be a little bit on the weak side. So you got to do different things to help balance it out. So again, this is just a little more of an exaggeration of you know, his back and his neck being tilted over from watching the television screen or the computer screen too much. Each part's going to connect to another part. You know, tight back, weak stomach. Tight legs on the front side, weak legs on the back side, or vice versa. Everybody, anybody ever stand up and your legs are so tight, like on the back side after you've been sitting for a while? It's like, oh, I got to do something to stretch my legs. So um, again, this is different types of issues that start to happen with the back. Too much of this, we call that um, kyphosis. Too much of this. Lordosis, and then, you know, we try to be somewhere in the middle of that. Middle is where you want to be. But again, over so many years of our lives, we start to, to get into habits that make it go one way or the other. So this is the concept of sitting on a wallet. A, a wallet that's only about an inch thick or so can throw the hips off by a certain amount, and then the whole spine, instead of it having a straight, you know, posture, goes off. And then next thing you know, he's got a neck issue because his wallet is very stiff underneath his rear end. So that's just, again, kind of highlighting that. So here puts it all together. You're sitting too much. You arch your back. You think you're doing good. It's not necessarily true. You round your back. It's definitely going to cause some problems. 
your back is either too much arched or too much rounded. And here it is again, affecting different parts. You started out with a knee, you know, my knee is an injury, but next thing, you know, a couple months down the road, your neck is bothering you. And, you know, people will go to the doctor and they can't figure it out. It's like, why is my back bothering me? It's, you know, knee injury. So if you've um, ever gone to a chiropractor, anybody been to a chiropractor before? You, you know what a chiropractor is, right? Their focus is mostly on the spine and how to keep the spine healthy with like all the things I've been talking about with posture. So as to keep all the nerves that feed to the different parts of the body. So now you have a lower back issue. Not only does it hurt in your back, but it starts to affect your digestion because some of the nerves that are in your lower back go to your large intestine, your bladder, um, down to the sciatic, down you know, all the way to your heel. You have an issue in the middle part of your back that might affect the internal organs, your liver, your stomach, your pancreas, your spleen. So keeping your back healthy is a very you know, important thing to do as we get older. This should not be new to you folks. You, you've probably known this, you've had back injuries or issues over the years. But the Chinese, um, traditional Chinese medicine, they connect it as um, not just the nerves, but the pressure points or the acupuncture meridians going down the back. So say you have some back issue or a neck issue, you go to the you know, Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine doctor and they put needles in different spots on your back. And next thing you know, it's like you feel great. Then you go back to sitting and then the whole thing starts over again. So acupressure and acupuncture doesn't necessarily fix the problem. Sitting, you have to get up from that chair. So here again is what we're looking for with our posture, trying to keep the joints lined up spine correct, um, but we get thrown off from our daily habits. Sitting in a chair, oftentimes we favor one side. If we look at our, our whole body, similar to a tree, your feet are your roots with the legs, your midsection, your trunk, that's the core, your arms are the, the branches and the leaves. If we look outside, we see this with the recent storm. You got trees that get knocked down, you got trees that are all, you know, the, the leaves are gone, the branches are broken off, but hopefully the trunk is still there and the root. So our root goes back to keeping our feet healthy. So uh, foot massage, you ever go get a foot massage, that's a good thing to do. To get a golf ball and roll it underneath your foot and get to all the different spots on your foot that don't feel really good when you put a golf ball under there and roll it around. That's really good for your circulation, really good for the nerves. Keep moving on here. So. Our lymphatic system, this is something that's become more noticeable, more talked about in recent years too, is if you don't move your body, you're not moving the, the lymph, which is basically like the, the waste products of our body. So even if you don't get up and you know, get out of the chair, you're not that active, your heart will still continue to beat and do what it needs to to get blood throughout your body. Your lymphatic system, if you don't move, it doesn't get engaged. And that's why some people, if they sit too much, they start to feel their ankles and their calves start to get thicker as the water or the, the lymph starts to accumulate in their lower body. So again, if you move your feet, toes, ankles, calves, that helps move the lymph. If you're up and about, moving your arms, your whole body, that's that much better for you to move the lymph. So it's kind of like you have your, uh, your house, use this as an analogy, and you have all the spigots in the house but you don't turn them on. And then you go out of town for a while and you come back and you haven't turned on the faucet in a while and it takes a while for the water to come spurting out. And then it comes out and there's probably some gunk in it and it's like, oh, that's nasty looking water. That's kind of how our lymphatic system works. If you don't move it, all that gunk is just kind of collecting in the body in the lymph nodes. And then you stand up and you start to move. Now it's gonna start moving, but it's sluggish. So very important that you move to get the lymph moving throughout your body. So now we start to address the, the, the mind, right? So I said, there's physical things that keep you stuck in a chair. There's also the mental things that keep you stuck in a chair. And that's, you know, you're afraid to go out or you don't have friends to hang out with. Maybe you're caught up with the news. Everything that comes in, you know, your work, your career, your health, your family, other issues that comes in by some means into your senses and then your brain processes it. And then you decide how much of it you wanna keep in your brain and how much of it you let go. So if you sit in front of a television all day long and watch whatever news shows on politics, well, you're probably gonna have rotted brain soon, right? <laughs> yeah. 
it's just not healthy. You know, it's, you know, maybe good to be, it's good to be informed, but too much of it, it's just not good. It's like eating too much junk food. You know, a uh, piece of tiramisu once in a while is really good. But for every meal of the day, every day, not that good. So we have to be careful what we eat with our eyes and our ears, what we take in as information. All of the, um, those sensory inputs affect our organs in certain ways. You've heard people are angry. You know, they got a lot of anger. Oftentimes that will affect their heart, but also their, their liver. Um, the bladder. If someone is really scared, and it happens with pets, they'll, they'll urinate. Like during the storms, if the lightning's really bad, a pet might, might urinate because they can't hold it. Well, we have the same thing happening with us. So each emotion is attached to a different organ. So again, if you're just kind of in that mode where you're not out and about and being active, it's really easy to get caught up you know, in you know, sadness or depression, anxiety, all these different things. They affect the organs. Make sense? Everybody knows these things. I'm just kind of rehashing and bringing it to the light. So the vitamin D issue, very important. Again, if you're not being active and you're getting out, you're, you're maybe not going to be getting enough vitamin, vitamin D. And it is a known uh, chronic issue with, I think, the statistics, like 70%, some crazy high figure, 70% of the American citizens don't get enough sunlight. If you live too far north, you're not getting out because it's cold. You live too far south, people stay out of the sun because they don't want to get skin cancer. So you got to, again, find that happy medium. And I'm, I'm almost positive that you know, a lot of people, as they get older, they're getting prescriptions for vitamin D supplements. You know, it's just kind of the way it is. Vitamin D affects your bones. Bones affect how much you can you know, get out and be active. So then vitamin D has an effect on your, your bones here. Anybody ever hear of Wolf's Law before? This is kind of the move it or lose it type of idea. If you are active, there's a certain amount of tension that's put on the muscles and the bones in your brain, processes it and says, hey, you're still active. We still need to keep sending the chemicals that make your bones stay strong and the muscles stay attached to the bones. So over time, this is the, the femur here, when people, again, are not that active, the femur gets weakened, and then that's where you hear people falling and they injure their hip. It's more susceptible to break because it's not under tension from regular activity. So a lot of the classes that I teach, not weight training, but weight training puts the body under tension. I do a fair amount of exercises that they are they're kind of like yoga, but they're standing. So people aren't getting up and down, up and down, get that you know, uncomfortable, you know, I can't get up. If they get on the ground, they're not going to get up. So a lot of things I teach, they're standing stances where we would stay here or here or here. You know, there's even where you're twisted, where you try to lift your leg you know, and stand in place. So that you're putting the muscles under tension so that the bones stay strong. It doesn't happen overnight. It's kind of like a month-to-month, -month, year year-to-year process. On the other side of it, if you sit in a chair for a prolonged amount of time, it's like, you know, it's dropping off. Your strength is dropping off quickly and you know, rapidly. So it's harder to build up than it is to break it down. So we keep going on here. Everybody's familiar with osteopenia, osteoporosis. You know, that's something everybody starts to encounter as you start to get older. I think they say after you know, age 50, you really got to start taking a look at that and making sure that your bones stay strong. And this is, again, just different ways how the bone, you know, it's under tension. The more tension it has on it, it stays thick. If there's no tension, the bones start to get thinner, and then eventually they're getting more porous, and then they can you know, be more brittle and break. And you've probably seen this before, people falling. You're going to hit your knee, maybe hit your hand. Something's going to break in between. So we try not to have that happen. So again, people will try not to fall by not being active kind of counterproductive. More people that are, or people that are more active might fall more, but their body might actually be stronger to be able to defend against it. So here's another concept. Your, your mind heals your body, your body protects your brain. Mind and body concept, everybody's heard this, mind, body, and spirit. So this is the Chinese symbol for that, the yin yang symbol. It's all about balance. So holistic health, which is more of the modern term that, you know, in the United States, it's a little bit more of a friendly term when you say 
um, yin and yang or traditional Chinese medicine. Some people are still a little standoffish with it being you know, a different culture. Holistic health. Oh, I know what that is. That's your mind and your body and uh, you know, your, your spirit or your awareness. So we can divide this into other things. And again, these are, I kind of post these so you can see that there's more, more depth to this whole sitting thing. It's not just that you sit. It's like, why do you sit so much? Why do I sit so much? I have a business. I work at home. I do graphics. And I teach classes. So I spend a lot of time doing this stuff. That's why I'm sitting a lot. So I got to offset it with doing other activities. So uh, to get into this a little bit, your, your mental, your mind, you know, the mental capacity. Knowledge is what you know, kind of like your library. You know, how many books do you have inside your head? Intelligence might be more how do you use that? You know, it's like I have a degree in something, but how do I use it? And your cognitive processes, it's like can I adapt as I need to? You know, the thing in front of me that I'm going to fall over. Can I react to it quick enough with my brain to my feet to know that I need to step off to the side? So how deep is the root? Comes back to that graphic where I said your feet, your waist, and your hands are kind of like the tree. So how, how deep is your knowledge of your health? Something for you, you know, to look at. Um, spiritual awareness, spirit or awareness, is your belief system, your morals and values, your consciousness to be able to think your connection, friends and family. Again, how deep is that? These things affect you getting out of the chair. If you are interested in learning more, you say you come out to all these activities, right? You're gonna, you wanna learn more. You wanna keep your brain engaged. So it's gonna get you out of the house. It's gonna get you up, off your feet more. Same thing with having connections to friends, family, whether you go to church or you know, social groups, it's gonna get you out more. Physical health. All the different parts, you know, your energy, your ability to sleep good, your immune system, how fast you heal, and then there's fitness, you know, strength, flexibility, endurance, speed. Again, how deep is that? So our endurance, speaking from a 60-year-old, our, our level of fitness is obviously going to be different than an 18-year-old. They can sit in a chair all day at school or, um, you know, sit and watch t TV all day and then get up and go run a marathon. You know, it's like, <laughs> how, how come they can do it? We can't. It's because it's their body is still at that age where they're, um, the brain is saying, hey, we need to grow. The chemical reactions keep making the body develop. As we get older, that, that lessens. So um, this shows us how having an awareness of, of where you're at right now. You're in my room talking about this, right? The awareness I'm talking about is where are you at in your head. You have a full-time job. It's you. If you want to stay healthy, you're old, you know, you're 50 years old and older. I think you're a little bit older than 50. I'm just guessing, right? You, a good part of your day is spent on trying to keep you healthy. So if you have something that has some meaning or purpose, gives you an awareness of what you're doing, we, we can call that as, you know, a calling. This is what I'm doing. As I continue to get older, I want to keep teaching more about health and fitness and how to stay, stay involved. Other cultures might call it this uh, ikigi. It's a Japanese word for having a meaning and purpose, something that gets you out of, the, out of the house every day. But you have to do the work, whatever that is. You know, if you do something one time, whether it's an exercise or you go to the library once, it's, it's just kind of like a one-time event. It's, you got to do it on a regular basis if you're going to gain the benefits from it. So you do something 100 times, you'll get some benefit from it. You do something 1,000 times, you're probably not going to forget it. If you want to learn a new language, you got to practice and put in the effort. You do something 10,000 times, then you're probably going to have a deeper understanding of it and be you know, masterful at it. These exercises that I just showed you a little bit, I've been doing them probably over 10,000 times throughout the course of my life. So what is the solution to all this other than just telling you, you got to get up, got to get out of the chair. You know, that's kind of a simple one. Um, smoking, what's going to help you to stop smoking? Someone telling you to stop smoking isn't going to help you to stop smoking, right? It's a very simplistic way of looking at it. So the solutions to being more active is, well, you could be non-active and you just ignore everything we're talking about. You can be proactive where something happened. You know, some of you might have been ill before, injured. Now it's like, okay, I got to stay active and exercise. That, uh, or that's reactive. Proactive is you take, take it before it happens. So you have exercises where you stand. Just getting up and standing, better than sitting. You have exercises where there's a little bit of movement in it. I'm going to demonstrate a couple of movements from the, the Tai Chi class that we do. So we start off with something like this. This is all considered dynamic. 
even though I'm not really moving my feet, I'm moving the limbs. Very specifically, which you know, limb is doing what. So that's more dynamic. Locomotive is where we're moving. So I'm doing those movements, but I might be taking steps. So I'm going to go from here and step and step and step. So you can do the same thing in other types of movements. Yoga somewhat, Pilates somewhat, um, hiking, walking. You know, each of them have those elements where you're either standing for a little bit or you're adjusting your body or you're moving from one spot to the next. And why is that important? Because we have other things that we can do here. We can implement <clears throat> lifestyle adjustments where you stand up and you get out and you walk, you know, stretch a little bit during the day. Stand-up desks. You said you have a stand-up desk. I have a stand-up desk. I do that, you know, prop it up so I'm not just sitting all day when I'm on the computer screen. Um, proper chair support. You, know, all, you all know the difference between a good chair and a bad chair, right? The bad chair is the $30 one you get like at Target or on Amazon. The $150 chair is the one that's got the lumbar support. I don't see any of them in this room, but you know the lumbar support, right? So you can get, you can get better furnishings. That can help you. Incorporating exercise. Sometimes people will do this when they're in their house or where they're staying is going from one spot to the next. You know, they might do some kind of walking exercise as they're going from one spot to the next. So they're making use of their time. Um, mental awareness strategy, being mindful. That goes back to having a purpose, to getting up every day. What gets you up? Could be grandchildren, family, a friend, some, you know, something that gets you up that you enjoy. Going to that class, going to get the coffee, you know, doing something that gets you up and out. So here we keep going. I have a question. Sure. Uh, could you give us some sample stretches that might be helpful? Definitely. I can do that as a group, or you can do it afterwards individually. So it depends on what, this, this is actually relative to right here, appropriate activities. So whether it's um, stretching, some yoga exercise, tai chi, weightlifting, you need to find what your level of fitness is that's appropriate. I go to the gym a couple days a week because I need to get more cardio and some of the strength training to make the bones stronger. There's some people I see at the gym, they're lifting way too heavy weight for what their ability is, and they're probably going to get injured in the process. On the other end of it, there's people that are lifting hardly any weight, and they're not giving themselves enough of a challenge so that the bones are engaged and the muscles are engaged. So there's finding that level of fitness that you're comfortable with. The quality of your health. You can't be running marathons if you got you know, some serious heart or cardiovascular issues. Goals. You know, what kind of activities are going to be reflective of what your goals are? If you want to achieve better balance, you got to practice exercises that make you challenge your balance. If you want to have um, more, like say you want to include this with your social network, you want to have more friends, well, part of that goal, you might, you might need to be a little more friendly. You might need to be a little more outgoing to be around people to actually build that network. So the appropriate activities kind of comes back to you. What's appropriate for you? Just because I'm showing you some stretching exercises, it might not be good for you or for you or for you. Everybody's going to be a little bit different with that. And then there's always your interests. You know, you don't like Tai Chi. Nope, not going to do it. Or you don't like swimming. Nope, don't like it. So hopefully you find what you enjoy to be your activity or activities to help you stay active and get out. Welcome to you. It's your new part-time job. In the other slide, I said it was your full-time job. It depends on you. For me, it's full-time. You know, if you're only spending a couple hours, then it might be a part-time job. So here's the overlap between fitness and health. Just because someone is fit doesn't mean they're healthy. Just because someone is healthy doesn't mean they're fit. If you can be both, then that's, that's good. That's, best of both worlds. Fitness would be like a lot of our younger generation. They can, like I said, do all kinds of crazy things, you know, drink, smoke, bad diet, and then they can go run a marathon and they can actually perform pretty well because they're young and their body's resilient and it can do that. On the other side, you can be healthy, you can be into whatever, you know, decade of your life and your, your body is healthy. You're disease free, everything works the way it is, but you cannot run a marathon or swim a mile, you know, it's like your body's just not fit to do that. So having some awareness of where you are at, then you can adjust and find the appropriate activity. Don't want to be doing marathons when it's not 
appropriate for you. So a lot of the types of exercises, there's some pictures of me doing some stuff from over the years, has to do with engaging your nervous system. Every movement you do, every activity you do engages your nervous system. If you're sitting in a chair, your nervous system is kind of getting a break. So as human beings, we have some inherent traits. One of them is we're kind of lazy. If we weren't lazy, you folks would all be standing while I'm talking. And if you really weren't lazy, you would be standing with one leg off the ground for the whole time. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we do kind of favor sitting. So that's why you know, it has become a bit of a chronic issue. We're also inherently curious. We see something like, what's this guy about? You know, it's kind of different, weird, you want to know about it. So we're curious. Oftentimes we're competitive. We don't want to be the last one. We don't want to be the weaker one. We don't want to be the one that falls. We don't want to be you know, that, that person. So again, once you're kind of aware of your inherent issues, you can find you know, certain types of activities that will work for you. But we have to engage the nervous system. If you don't engage with moving the body, the nervous system says, hey, I'm on a holiday. I'm checking out. And that gets to be more relative as we go you know, further into this. So we have a lot of exercises. 90% of what I got up on this, this uh, image right here are exercises that are not on the ground. And I, I, I kind of show this as a good representation of so many different exercises that make it kind of interesting. So this is my plug, too, for if you folks want to do a class here sometime for me to come, come back and teach a Tai Chi class or a Qigong class or standing yoga. These are the types of exercises that they're interesting. And they do engage so much more of the body. It's not just like you're doing you know, dumbbell curls and your biceps are getting bigger and you're like, I'm, you know, I'm 60 years old. Why do I need to have big biceps? Who cares, right? But overall, you want to have a strong body. You want to have core strength. So all these exercises are different options that you can you know, maybe learn down the road. So these are some of my past classes. This was at the Winter Park um, Center for Better Bones, they called it. Tai Chi exercises. This is my class at uh, university club, the University Club in Winter Park. I was standing on one leg. This is Winter Park Presbyterian Church. I was doing different types of uh, breathing exercises and stretching exercises. This was at the Lutheran Redeemer Church in Winter Park. So oftentimes churches will get a hold of me because they have, uh, you know, in their mission statement, they want to be healthy, sound mind, sound body. So they'll ask me to come out and give a class or teach a class, you know, lecture or whatever the case may be. So what we talked about earlier, I said you move it or lose it, has a lot to do with this growth hormone. As soon as your body, you know, your body does so many things involuntarily. Voluntary, you tell your hands to move, your legs move, right? Involuntary is all the processes that happen on the inside, internally. So as we continue to you know, not be as active, the processes in our brain says, we can take a holiday, we can take a vacation. We're not gonna produce as much growth hormone so that the bones continue to grow strong or heal or the muscles can heal without as much growth hormone, which does diminish naturally, your, your body continues to decline. It, it holds true, you, know, you gotta move it or else you will lose it. So that is the end of, uh, the screen presentation. I know you folks love my graphics and staring at the, at, the, at the screen over here. Hopefully I gave you some other interaction as we go through, you know, went through it with you know, discussing different things. So for the last part of the class, we got a few minutes left. Does anybody have any questions or comments? You had said something about stretching. Well, I was going on the assumption that we are sitting most of the time. And if that's the case, which it is, are there maybe some exercises that we could do while we're sitting that could help improve our lives instead of... All right, so you're stuck in your chair or you wanna be in your chair. You know, maybe that's your choice. You, you, you just you have to be sitting more often. So if you can get where you're holding your leg out and off the ground, that in itself is a good exercise to hold the leg off the ground because you're engaging the quadriceps, you know, holding your leg straight. You can point your toes, pull your toes. Now you're engaging the calf muscles, muscles from your ankle to your foot, and then you can also get the toes. You can point and like curl your toes down, come back and try and pull the toes back. You, know, you only have so much range of motion with your toes, 
but you can try, right? So holding it up, locking it, pointing, pulling, pointing, pulling. Really good exercise as far as giving you strength in the, the quadriceps, giving you mobility of your ankle. The more you do that one, your knee gets stronger also. So if you have weak knees, that's all connected to the, the quadriceps muscles. You got four different muscles that attach quad, you know, four muscles that go towards the knee. So that's a very good one for sitting. You need more for sitting. You can also try to do where you bring the knee up and bring the knee and the thigh back. So now that starts to stretch the hamstrings. And then you, again, can let it go. So if you're going to do stretching, you try to do you know, increments. Say, say you do 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Try to get to 30 seconds, because it takes a certain amount of time for the muscles to relax when you're in a stretch. The first part, the muscles are kind of on guard. So there's a little bit of tension when you're trying to stretch. But then you take another 10 seconds, another 20 seconds, the muscles now start to relax and say, oh, we're not going to get injured from this activity. So they relax, and then you can go a little bit further or hold it a little bit longer. But usually when you're really tight, and you, know, and you try and do something, oh, it's tight, and your body kind of spasms and doesn't, you know, your body tells you, I don't want to stretch. So you got to kind of work past that. So ideally, you start you know, 10 seconds, just keep adding on to it. Up to about a minute, a minute could be a good stretch if you want to hold it that long. And if you're sitting, it not, might not be as you know, strenuous as if you were standing and trying to do it, right? So this one here, same thing. Try to do 10 of them. You know, it takes a minute. You do 10 of them. Then you do your other leg. And then, you know, tomorrow you try it again. And then you realize, okay, you know, it's good. You know, maybe my ankle got a little sore the next day or so. And then you keep trying to add on. So you do 10 at a time, 20 at a time. Do it a couple times a day. That was one of the points. Is try to do things regularly. You know, I really like salads, but I'm not going to eat them all the time. Well, you're probably not going to get that much benefit from eating a healthy salad one time. You know, a couple times a week, then your digestion will adjust and you'll probably you know, gain benefits from Thank you. I think those doing salad. Helpful. Those are great exercises. So if I was standing, I could use a chair or a wall. And now I'm getting more engaged because now I have to use a bit more of my core to do that same exercise. So now it's not just my quadriceps. This leg is also engaged, the quadriceps and the hamstrings and the butt and my, my core from standing. So the big difference between here where you're just isolating you know, four muscles of your thigh. Now I have four muscles on both legs with the thigh, hamstrings, um, buttocks, back, abdominals. And you can try and hold this higher too. You know, I've been doing this a little while, so I can hold it up longer. But, you know, you folks might start out down here a little bit. And then, oh, I'm doing great. That's easy. Then it's no chair, no wall. And you try and do the same thing. Now you're engaging not just more muscles, but you're engaging your, your inner ear, and your inner ear has a lot to do with balance. There's a couple handouts on the inner ear. You folks are familiar with inner ear issues? That affects your balance and your stability. So now I got the muscles, I got the inner ear, I'm aware of what I'm doing, I'm not gonna be distracted if I'm doing that one. If I'm doing this one, I could be watching TV and doing it. It's easy to become distracted if you want to be distracted. If I'm standing up and I, okay, I don't want to fall. You know, I'm at this level, I can do this. This is my focus. I don't have the TV on. I'm not talking to my neighbor. You know, I'm focusing on this. So those are good ones. I could do this too. You know, you might, you know, be careful with these. I'm assuming not everybody's the same, you know, as far as your health and fitness goes. And then I would do it here, no chair. So, yeah, I can do all kinds of cool stuff. So, but I started when I was very young. So I have a certain amount of muscle memory with, you know, my body feels like comfortable doing it. And I've been doing it pretty regularly. So any other questions? That's just two stretches. You know, there's, there's probably 
you know, 100 other ones if we really got down to it. Well, my knees were very, very stiff. Stiff knees? Down, mm -hmm. all the way down my leg. And under my right leg, I've had a pain at the side for about the last 18 years. Mm. When I'm sitting, I don't feel that pain. But the minute I stand up and put weight, and that's what discourages me. Yep, there you go. You have a chronic issue that's going to make you yes. adjust your lifestyle from it. So have you tried any kind of exercise? Are you doing any kind of activities? I've, I've tried quite a few, but that pain <laughs> just gets worse. <laughs> so in the knee, on the side, and on the back? Or still on the side? Well, it's, 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 it's right underneath the joint. Right in here. Mm. So I'm not a doctor, so I can't describe or diagnose, well. prescribe or diagnose, but I can suggest. So um, I always say Tai Chi because I've been doing this forever. And, and I, I know the benefits that can come from doing that. Yoga, I would suggest some kind of yoga, probably not where you're getting on the ground and up. Because again, those are exercises that you can use your discretion of how much or how little effort you put into it, how much you bend, you know, all that. Just like what I did with the thing in the chair. You know, you can adjust how much of the exercises you do. And then chances are there's, you know, some specific exercise. Oh, you got to do this exercise that will affect that muscle so that that's going to get better. But again, I can't prescribe that or diagnose that. So I would suggest, you know, trying different activities, more along the lines of yoga, tai chi, maybe swimming. Walking is always, you know, kind of the, the, the staple. You gotta be able to walk. You gotta try to get walking in. And then, uh, you know, just stretching in general. Most of the stretching exercises that you see like at health clubs or on YouTube television shows and stuff, a lot of the, yoga, or the stretching, it's just yoga exercises. So can you do like the stretches that we did? You know, this type of stuff where you're yes. trying to pull it back. Yes. And now that doesn't hurt. But if I stand up and try that, it's a whole different Because now you have weight yes. on the structure. You have, um, your, your muscles are being engaged differently from supporting your weight. Well, I have scoliosis, and I think it stretched my IT band when my IT band isn't getting the good <laughs> So the IT band, both of them, are affected a lot by the types of exercises that I do because you do a fair amount of shifting of your weight, and when you shift your weight, it puts the tension on that structure. So not only is it strengthening, but you're also getting flexibility when you're moving from one side to the next. So the IT bands actually get stretched and strengthened when we do these kind of movements. And you're going back and forth, slowly down, slowly up. Um, do you know what the rollers are? Form, a foam roller. They're like a yes. stick, and it rolls. You can spin it, kind of like a bakery roller. Yes. I, yes. You know what I'm talking about. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. That sometimes helps to t loosen up. This area will affect oftentimes the knee, because that IT band goes all the way from up by your hip bone all the way down to the, the tibia. Just yes. below the knee right there. So it's a big stretch. And so I think that's where the pain is coming from. And because of that, because I had pain and because my knees were wearing out from arthritis, I got two knee replacements on this knee, which didn't help at all mm. because it wasn't that. It was this. That now does I happen, yeah. Right. It just wasn't going to budge. So if you stay after a minute or two, I'll give you a couple other options, some, some other things I could suggest. Okay. So did anybody else have any other questions or comments? Of course, you can all stay after, and we can talk for a little bit too. But 
we, we said we were going to be here till about three, so you know we got to conclude at some point. So, were there any questions as a group? That well, I, I tell you, I uh, have a problem with vertigo. Okay. And um, I took Tai Chi, which was wonderful, and and now, <clears throat> quite frankly, another problem. I had long COVID, mm. and long COVID absolutely affects your ears. Right. And so I'm having trouble keeping my balance walking, although I'm walking pretty good, but it's not the same. You know, yeah. I don't know what I can do about it. <coughs> I've had, uh, you know, a lot of therapy and so forth, so right. just keep going. Yeah, there's, you know, for some issues, physical issues, it's not like there's just, you know, okay, do this and you're going to fix it. It's progression of different things that you know have happened and what you need to do. I can only suggest from my experience from doing Tai Chi and Qigong for you know almost 40, 43 years now or so that there's a lot of benefits that come from that kind of activity. So again if you have questions please stay after otherwise we're gonna wrap it up for today. So be well, be safe. Take care.